Thank you, everyone. I request all the audience to be kindly seated. We'll now have the keynote speech by our guest speaker, Professor Abhishek Dar from ICTS Bangalore. OK, so uh, maybe we'll start. Uh, so again, I would like to thank the university for uh, inviting me here. So, uh, so I'm a theoretical physicist, and I work in an uh, area called statistical physics and condensed matter physics. Uh, uh, so, but today, I'll uh, not talk too much uh, about my work, really. Uh, I'll talk about simple uh, things which uh, kind of are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, try to explain uh, the ideas behind, uh, like, the approach in, uh, uh, and the pro kind of problems that I look at, okay? So, uh, statistical mechanics is basically about uh, trying to understand, uh, like, uh, every day, uh, what you see every day, like, uh, uh, things uh, starting from the uh, properties of large number of molecules which you don't see. Okay, so you don't see all the molecules, but you have air, and for air you have some properties which uh, you can understand. Okay, starting from some basic uh, principles. Okay. So I'll try to give very simple examples of the basic idea of like uh, how uh, random events and uh, large numbers uh, from uh, from such things you can actually uh, find predi predictable laws uh, and. Uh, uh, some patterns. Okay, so uh, yeah, so I'll start with this uh, demonstration. So this is something called a Galton probability machine. Uh, has anyone seen this? Can you? Re re no. Okay. So basically, what you see here, uh, maybe it's not uh, the visibility is not very high. Uh, okay. So. Uh, so this is some two, there are two glass plates, and in, inside there's some structure. So, there are, uh, so there's a lat, uh, kind of a triangular lattice made out of, uh, like you just put pins in this, uh, in a board, and you make a triangular lattice here. And uh, then out here there's a kind of a funnel, and you can drop balls from here. Okay, so you can drop balls, and the balls will go down, and then they, there are lots of bins here, and they get collected at the bottom. Okay. And uh, what you'll see is that uh, uh, every time you do the experiment, every time the balls will collect and uh, form this nice pattern. Okay, so let's just see the uh, uh, experiment. Uh, so you can uh, so you collect all the balls in this uh, funnel, and then you invert it, and you see all the b b balls go down and collect and form this curve. Okay, so uh, this is another. T you just see it again. Uh, balls going down and uh, forming this curve. Okay, so every time you do this, you always get the same result. Okay, so things are happening randomly, but uh, eventually you get a nice pattern. Okay, so here now you can see it in slow motion. Uh, these balls are going down. There's some. Uh, there's a lattice here of these pins, and the particles basically scatter, scatter, and when they come down, they collect in these uh, boxes. Uh, but uh, you can see the number of uh, there are some number of uh, balls in each box, right? Uh, and uh, you have this nice pattern. Okay, so you can count uh, like how many balls are there in each of these boxes, and if you plot this as a histogram, you'll find this uh, uh, this uh, uh, this smooth curve. Okay, so this uh, uh, this uh, what you see is basically uh, this. Uh, I mean, each ball is doing a chaotic motion. So it goes down, uh, then it hits uh, uh, some pin, and it can go this way or that way. So it moves in a chaotic way. Uh, but if, when you do a large number of balls, then eventually uh, you find there's some pattern. Okay. So, uh, and uh, the pattern is there are more balls at the center, less at the sides, and you get a nice uh, bell-shaped curve, which is called a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so this thing was uh, discovered by someone called uh, uh, Francis Galton, uh, and it's called a bean machine. So this was uh, in a lo long time back, in like 1900 or something. Uh, and he invented this uh, machine. It's called a bean machine, sometimes called a Galton board or a queen and uh, what he wanted so is this is this is the time at which uh, at during which probability theory was developing and he just wanted to show and de to demonstrate to people that uh, from random events you can get information out of uh, them okay so i mean uh, so he was one of the first person who used statistics and probability theory to actually study real data and extract information from uh, this okay so he was a really very versatile character. I mean, uh, he did lots of things. And you can see he was a statistician, a sociologist, psychologist, and all of uh, these things at the same time. Okay, So uh, 
he was quite a genius uh, person, okay. And he used to make these simple things with his hand just to demonstrate uh, that, uh, I mean, randomness can lead to information. Okay, so now we can actually understand what uh, ex uh, this, uh, this simple experiment in a very mathematical and uh, rigorous way. And the basic idea is that, okay, so in that, uh, in that ma machine I showed, at the top you have this kind of a, a lattice, okay. And these are like, uh, th so these are pins uh, stuck on a triangular lattice. And uh, when a ball comes, when a ball drops from the top, it can, every time it can, uh, it hits the thing, it can go either this way or that way, okay. And then if it goes that way, the next time it can go again this way or that way. Supposing it goes this way, again it has two choices. And uh, this is one particular trajectory that a given ball will follow, okay. So there are of course lots of different possibilities, right. It could have gone like that and then come like that. And, and depending on the trajectory, it will collect at different uh, locations in this, uh, uh, on the x-axis, okay. So in this particular example, the ball goes down and uh, reaches x equal to 5. In another realization, it will come and collect somewhere else, okay. So now uh, we can ask if you drop large number of balls, then uh, how many balls will there be in each location? Okay, given that each ball does this random uh, walk. Okay, so this is what is called a random walk, where each, at each time you move this way or that way with equal probability. Okay, so this is a very simple and uh, important uh, model in mathematics and physics. Uh, so, okay, so here after t 11 steps, the ball is at x equal to five, okay. Now, uh, so what, all, uh, what are the possibilities? Okay, so we, this is just a counting problem. And uh, you can see that uh, if you drop two balls, there are only two possibilities. They can just go this way, that way. If you drop four balls, there are, after two time steps, there are four possible trajectories. They can, uh, like, there is one trajectory like that, one trajectory like that, one like that. So there are two balls. Uh, if you drop four balls, there will be two balls collecting here, one ball here, one ball here, okay, with high probability. If you drop eight balls, you'll get something like that. And then you can just keep going uh, down like this, right? And uh, then some of you can guess what, uh, I mean, how the pattern grows as you go down. Uh, and uh, this is uh, something maybe you have heard of. It will generate something called a Pascal's tri triangle, right? So this is the Pascal's triangle. And uh, the rule is very simple. Like uh, you add these two numbers, you get three. You add these numbers, you get three. And uh, then you add these numbers, you get six. You add these two numbers, you get four. And you can go down. And this precisely gives you, uh, like, uh, if you drop a large number of balls, how many balls will be there at each, uh, at, uh, at some lower level? Okay, so this is, like I said, it's called the Pascal Triangle. And if you, uh, so out here, uh, if you add these numbers, it's two to the power six balls. Okay, so if you drop uh, 64 balls, then you'll find that uh, so many collect at e in each pin. Okay, so you can see more balls will collect at the center. So all possibilities are allowed. But uh, and there are more paths which lead to the origin, uh, which is uh, this, than to this point. Right? So to reach here, there's only one path. Uh, and so you only get one ball. But uh, most of the balls will land up here. Okay. So now you can, of course, write a formula. You can uh, do some uh, combinatorial calculation and ask uh, how many ball, I mean, if you drop uh, n number of balls, how many will collect uh, at this uh, place? Okay. Okay, so uh, if you plot, like, uh, on a, if you make a histogram, like how many balls have collected at each point, uh, then uh, you get something like this. And uh, there's actually a formula for uh, the number of balls at each side. So this is just like a combinatorial problem. Uh, if you have t balls, then you have to choose uh, uh, some number of balls uh, which go to a given point. And uh, you can convince yourself that this is the answer. Okay, so this is a binomial distribution if you have, uh, you have seen it. And uh, then something interesting happens. If you are looking at large number of balls, then uh, this function, uh, so here I have plotted this red points are exactly these uh, values. Okay, so if, uh, this is maybe for uh, some uh, thousand balls. If you drop and calculate this number, these red points are these numbers. Okay. But if, if it's the number is large, like if I drop a thousand uh, balls, then uh, this function is actually almost equal to this function. Okay, so this of course is a normal distribution, Gaussian distribution, or it's called a Bell distribution. And this is that smooth curve, okay. So these two, you can see these points are almost uh, the same. Uh, and this happens whenever the numbers are large, okay. So that's how you get, uh, 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 so this is uh, exactly, uh, so this is the normal distribution and this is, 
uh, exactly what we saw in the Galton board. Okay, so it's a I mean a simple experiment which you can understand completely rigorously in math uh, and mathematically. Okay, uh, so this idea of random walks in work uh, occurs in all over science. Okay, so uh, this thing, this whole uh, subject developed around. Uh, in the 1900s, and in different areas, okay. So people doing uh, like studying uh, prices of stock, uh, uh, stock prices in uh, the fi financial market. So there's a lot of data, and if you just ask, uh, like every day it fluctuates, then uh, is there some pattern, okay? And then people saw that it can be explained by this uh, random walk model. Uh, in ecology, I mean, uh, in uh, uh, you have heard of Ronald Ross, who uh, discovered, uh, I think, in India itself, in that uh, mosquitoes cause malaria. Okay, and he was interested in like understanding uh, how uh, the uh, how do ev populations of mosquito evolve. Okay, so uh, I mean the simplest thing model. So you have to, of course, you can't look at every mosquito and see how it goes. So the simplest thing to uh, assume is that each mosquito kind of moves randomly. Okay, so. Uh, they, uh, I mean, you can see that they kind of do a r completely random motion, right? And if you have a large population of them, you can ask, uh, how does this evolve in time? So, uh, I mean, he uh, developed, he wrote this uh, model, but then he couldn't solve it and he couldn't get any predictions. So he wrote to this mathematician called Carl Pearson uh, in 1904. And then he, uh, even he couldn't solve. And then he wrote a paper, I mean, he wrote a small letter in this uh, journal called Nature. And he asked, like, can anyone solve this problem? Okay, and uh, so uh, basically he stated the problem like this. Uh, you start from some point and you randomly move, uh, let's say, one um, meter in some direction. Then you change your direction randomly and again move, let's say, one meter in another direction. And you keep doing this, right? So every, uh, every, uh, every time step, you move in a random direction for, uh, in a, for a given distance, change your direction and move that. Okay, then, uh, so if you imagine that a large number of mosquitoes are doing the same thing, then you can, you can ask after, uh, after a, number, a given amount of time, uh, like what is the, so initially all the mosquitoes started from the, or let's say the origin. I mean, then you can ask how is the population distributed now after some time, right? So this is the question he asked. And uh, interestingly, I mean, this, uh, in the next journal of, uh, this, uh, in, in the next issue of uh, nature, uh, this problem was solved by uh, Lord Rayleigh, who could, uh, he was studying sound in, uh, like, uh, in random medium, okay? So how does sound, of course, like, if it uh, is in a random medium, it gets scattered, okay? So you can imagine if you're talking and there are people everywhere, I mean, the sound has, uh, will get scattered and then it uh, finally it reaches some place, okay? So this is the problem that Rayleigh was st studying and he could relate uh, what he was studying to the question that uh, Pearson asked and he uh, was able to obtain a mathematical solution, okay? So the number of, so basically if you start from the origin and all the mosquitoes are asked, starting from the origin and you ask how many are there after some time uh, n, so n here is the time, uh, after uh, n units of time, uh, like what is the distribution of uh, mosquitoes uh, at distance r? Okay, so this is what it will look like. Uh, I mean, after uh, let's say this is after uh, 2,000 mosquitoes starting from the origin. After some time, uh, uh, some units, some uh, amount of time, they look like this. And you can ask in in this small distance uh, r to r plus dr, how many? Uh, you just count them, and you get this histogram, and this fits to this nice function. Okay. So this is, uh, I mean, you can make a, a, a prediction from, uh, a, uh, from this completely random uh, events. Uh, okay, so I mean, uh, random walks, like I said, are, uh, have been used in finance uh, and mathematics. It's a very interesting, lots of beautiful questions and in computer science and statistics. In astrophysics, uh, I mean, uh, Chandrasekhar was one of the first persons to use the idea of the, like, uh, uh, random uh, uh, forces and so on. And he wrote a beautiful article in Reviews in Modern Physics uh, on these uh, st uh, stochastic processes. Uh, and in statistical physics there are, uh, and condensed matter physics, it's used everywhere. I'll give some uh, example in uh, something called Brownian motion, which uh, is uh, maybe something which you can easily do an experiment in if you have a, uh, like 
a very simple microscope, OK? So this is an experiment which I really encourage people, uh, undergraduate students and also uh, master's students, uh, to perform. Uh, they just need a simple microscope, OK? So this experiment is you just take, uh, uh, you take a, a slide, a microscope slide, and you put a drop of water, and then you take a syringe and maybe just dip it in water and uh, dip it in milk, and uh, then uh, put uh, and uh, then uh, put it in this drop of water. Okay, so this drop of water will have this. Uh, so milk consists of colloidal particles, which are like micron sized uh, in uh, uh, micron sized, and when you put in them in water. Uh, they form a, like a, a sort of a dilute uh, suspension of these colloidal particles. Okay, so water has tiny, tiny molecules, but these colloidal particles are like much bigger, micron-sized, and they are uh, floating around in this water. Now you co close the slide and then just watch, watch it under the microscope. Okay, so this is uh, so these are the colloidal particles, these milk particles in water. Okay, these are micron-sized, which you can see under the microscope, and what you'll see is uh, basically this, okay. So it's completely sealed and all. And if you look under the microscope, you see that uh, they are just jiggling around, okay. So, uh, so this is Brownian motion. And if you take smaller particles, then uh, you see something like this. You see that they move much faster, okay. It's completely sealed. Uh, just put this uh, nano, I mean, some nano-sized particles in water and watch under the microscope. This is, of course, you can't see with a normal microscope. This you can see. Okay, so uh, this is uh, Brownian motion and it was uh, uh, discovered again very early uh, by this uh, uh, Robert Brown. And he wrote a, a nice thesis on, uh, uh, on his observations. Uh, he, I mean, he spent like, uh, like years uh, just looking at this. Okay, so he was very puzzled. I mean, when you see some completely uh, inanimate objects under the microscope and they're just moving around, I mean, then the first question is why, I mean, why do they move around, right? Uh, and initially he thought that maybe they're living objects. Uh, and so uh, he did a, uh, he put in a lot of effort to make sure that they are not living. Okay, so he boiled them and uh, put them under heat treatment. He collected soil from like very uh, uh, remote places where they have to be dead. And he always saw that uh, they are always moving around. Okay, so he didn't understand, but he wrote down his observations uh, uh, and uh, uh, like uh, whatever he could uh, observe, he just wrote it down. Okay, and uh, so this was not understand. Uh, like uh, you can, you could observe this random motion, but what information can you get out of it? Right, that's an important question. And uh, till 1905, I mean, no one really knew uh, like how to understand it. Uh, and in 1905, this was uh, this is referred to as Einstein's uh, miracle year. I mean, uh, it was quite amazing. He discovered, like, he made several discoveries in uh, this uh, important discoveries. He discovered the photoelectric effect for which he got the Nobel Prize, uh, and then special relativity and this famous formula equal to mc square and all that. And uh, but one of the things he also discovered is that he developed a theory of uh, Brownian motion. Okay. So I'll try to explain what his basic idea is. So very simple ideas, but you can extract uh, you can uh, extract a lot of information about the system from just simple observations. Okay. So what was uh, Einstein's idea? So I, Einstein basically saw that these particles are doing this. Uh, uh, so if you look at uh, particles starting from the origin, let's say at some given position, which you call the origin. And after every 30 seconds, you look at its, you look where, where is its position. Okay, you'll find it's here after 30 seconds, after 30 more seconds, it's here, and so on. So after a given time t, it, uh, I mean, it might land up very close to the starting point, right? Because it's random. And uh, let's say this distance is r. Uh, okay, so so this motion is like that. If you, I mean, if, if you look at a drunkard, that it looks like exactly this. Okay. So let's say after uh, 24 time steps, you ar ar uh, arrive here. So that's the distance r. Uh, then uh, what you can show is that if it's a random motion, then the uh, mean square, like the standard deviation of the distance you have traveled, is, uh, is goes as uh, linear in t. Okay? And then this, this d, which is called a diffusion constant. Okay? So you just uh, do a random walk. You see how much you have traveled. Uh, and you look at, uh, you do this many times, and you ask what is the variance of the distance I traveled, and that grows linearly with time, okay? And this is called the diffusion constant, okay? 
And uh, what uh, Einstein showed is that actually this diffusion constant is related to some properties of the fluid. Okay, so it depends on the temperature at which you are working. It depends on this fundamental constant called Boltzmann's constant. And then it depends on, uh, so this is, you can uh, identify the six pi eta A. It's the, if you drop a particle in water or some highly viscous fluid, uh, then there's a drag force, which is precisely this, right? Six pi uh, viscosity times the radius of the ball. So, uh, I mean, somehow the, this uh, motion of this, uh, uh, this micron, uh, this um, colloidal particles in uh, water or whatever fluid is uh, precisely given by all these other properties of the fluid. Okay, so this is what uh, Einstein found. And I'll just tell you what is uh, like his basic ideas uh, of the derivation was, okay. So, I mean, uh, so it's a very simple physical derivation. So what he said was, Okay, so if you look, if you, this experiment all of you have done, like you, there, you know the Stokes drag force, if you drop a, part, a ball in like silicon oil or uh, glycerol, you'll find that uh, there's a, uh, it goes down and then attains a terminal velocity, uh, which is given by precisely this, right? Uh, so, uh, I mean, usually you have to subtract some buoyant, uh, buoyant, uh, buoyancy term, but uh, if you ignore that, it's the weight of the thing divided by the frictional force. Okay, so this is the terminal velocity. Okay, so if you imagine a, a beaker full of uh, uh, water, then uh, these colloidal particles will fall down in the water, and uh, the, uh, they should attain a terminal velocity like that, and they should just go down, right? Okay, so now if they go down, then you'll get some concentration grad gradient. All the particles are at the bottom, and so there's a lot of particles, so they will start diffusing. Okay, and if they start diffusing, then the, there's an upward current of particles, which is given by something called Fick's law, that it's proportional to the gradient of uh, density times the diffusion constant, okay. So there's a downward current of particles because they are all falling down, and there's an upward current because they are diffusing, because if there are too many things at the bottom, they will uh, start going up. Okay, so uh, eventually this system will reach a steady state, and uh, these two currents will be balanced. And so Einstein said that uh, this is the balance condition. Now, this is a simple equation which you can solve, and uh, basically you get a solution like, uh, uh, okay, so, yeah, so if you look at this equation, uh, from this you can say what is the density, so this rho of x is the density of these colloidal particles in water, okay. And uh, if you solve this equation, you know the density, okay. But now we know that in, if a system is in equilibrium, the density of uh, things goes down exponentially. Uh, so this is called some pressure law, but basically it has this form. Okay, so the density goes down as you go up uh, exponentially, and this is the uh, this is a Boltzmann distribution. Okay, now if you uh, plug it in the, uh, this formula, then uh, basically you get this relation, and uh, then uh, if you compare this uh, these two equations, you basically get uh, that that uh, so. So this is from our earlier balance condition of the two currents, and this follows from this equation. Now, if you just compare these two equations, then you get that, uh, uh, basically, you get a, this, uh, this relation between the diffusion constant on all the properties of the fluid. Okay. So basically, the idea is you are balancing, uh, so there's a dissipation in the system caused by the fluid, and there is also some sort of fluctuations uh, in the system because uh, that's what ri gives rise to the diffusion. And there's a relation between this fluctuation and dissipation which gives rise to this uh, relation, okay? So now, uh, from this uh, formula, what you can do is, okay, so there's this Boltzmann's constant, which you can write in terms of uh, the gas constant times temperature by the Avogadro's number, right? And you can invert this relation and you have a formula for the Avogadro's number in terms of all these other quantities. Okay, so now what uh, you observe is that uh, these are all, all these things you can measure in the lab. Okay, so you can look at the uh, partic uh, this colloidal particles under the microscope and uh, you see that uh, you can find the diffusion constant. You just find uh, what is the distance they travel in a given time. You take square of that and uh, find the mean square deviation. From that you find the diff diffusion constant. Viscosity is something you can measure. The size of the particles you can measure and uh, you know the gas constant independently and you know the temperature, okay? So then you can use this to find the Avogadro's number. 
Okay, so uh, in uh, again 1909, uh, so this uh, uh, this uh, physicist called uh, Jean Pera, uh, he did this experiment uh, where he used Einstein's uh, formula and uh, actually uh, determined uh, Avogadro's number from this uh, from this uh, experiment from this Brownian motion experiment. Okay, so basically this is from his experiment. He just took a graph paper and uh, like after every 30 seconds, so at that time there were no video cameras and so on. So at, after every 30 seconds, you just uh, plot the position of the, uh, uh, of the Brownian particle in, uh, 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 the, uh, on this uh, graph paper. Okay? And he generated these uh, curves and then he computed the diffusion constant and so on. And uh, from, this, uh, from his experiment, he actually estimated the Avogadro's number to be this uh, uh, seven, he got, uh, of course it was not uh, completely accurate, but this was one of the first time, uh, first uh, accurate determination of uh, this fundamental constant. Okay, uh, so I mean normally we just know it's a six into 10 to the power 10 to 23, we just learn it in school, right? But if you ask like, where does this number come from? How do you actually people measure it? It's quite uh, complicated, okay. And uh, so, but uh, the fact is that using this very simple eye observation of well, this random motion in particles, uh, just from that observation you can extract such a fundamental uh, number, okay. So for this discovery, I mean, uh, uh, and lots of other interesting experiments on uh, these colloidal particles uh, sedimenting in these fluids, he got the Nobel Prize in 1926. Okay, so... Uh, Okay, so, uh, so I uh, to told you about this, uh, uh, so about Einstein's theory of Brownian motion. So the basic idea is that if you look at this uh, colloidal particles, uh, so if you drop a tiny ball in uh, water, of course you just see it going down, uh, going down and attaining a terminal velocity and then it goes and sits at the bottom of the beaker, right? But if you make it smaller and smaller, you'll find that uh, it doesn't go and sit at the bottom. It will keep uh, moving around. Okay. So now you can ask, why does it do that? That's because, uh, I mean, this, there are these water molecules which keep uh, bomb bombarding it uh, at all, uh, like, uh, constantly. And uh, so that gives rise to this uh, motion. Okay. So if it's a big ball, of course, this random motion doesn't affect it at all. But when you go to tinier and tinier sizes, then uh, these things start uh, affecting it, okay. So, uh, so if you, uh, like, you can do this, uh, if you do a, a molecular dynamic simulation, uh, you can put a big particle, which is like your colloidal particle, and these small particles are like water molecules, okay. Uh, so in, uh, in, for colloidal particles, of course, the size is much, much bigger. I mean, so this is not to scale. I mean, uh, this blue ball should be really, uh, maybe it feels, uh, it's much bigger compared to the water molecules, okay? Micron and nanometers, right? So that's much bigger. Here it's like maybe order of a factor of 10, there is factor of 1,000. But this is just to illustrate that there's a big uh, difference in sizes. Okay, so if you do the, look at the simulation, you'll see this is what uh, you observe. Uh, so even though there's gravity, uh, on an average it will keep going up and down, okay? So it might go down a bit, but uh, there's always fluctuations. Okay, now of course, uh, in principle, the, I mean, this system is described by Newton's equations, and uh, you can write an equation of motion for all the particles, okay? But that's too complicated. There are like uh, billions of particles hitting this object. Uh, and what uh, this physicist called uh, Langeva found is that uh, you can write a very simple equation for uh, this uh, big object, okay? So somehow you can forget all the details of the fluid. You can uh, just focus on the particle. And what you find is, okay, so I mean, so this is the equation of motion that he wrote. So the first three terms I think you already know. Uh, this is just gravity, this is the buoyancy force. Uh, so this buoyant force also, of course, is coming from the fluid, right? Because there's fluid, it, there's buoyancy force. So this is also coming from the fluid. This is just an external force from the gravity. And then this is some term that you have seen. This is the viscous drag. This is also coming from the fluid. And then there's an extra force, which is called a random force. Okay, so it's a fluctuating force, uh, which is coming because these guys are hitting it randomly all the time. Okay, and... Uh, and this random force has some properties that on an average, so this indicates that on an average it's zero, 
because it's coming from all directions. So on an average, it doesn't do anything. But uh, it has uh, the strength of the noise is uh, basically related to the uh, dissipation constant and to, to the temperature. Okay. So uh, basically, both these forces are coming from the fluid. And uh, you can forget everything and just write this simple expression. But you have to remember that there are these fluctuations and this dissipation. And these are not un completely unrelated, because they are coming from the same source. Okay, so this is called a fluctuation dissipation relation, which is very important in, uh, like, uh, uh, in all of physics. Okay. And this is the simplest example of such a thing. Uh, fluctuations and dissipations are related. Okay. And this is the relation. So this is what Langeva achieved. He could write in a simple equation of motion for individual Brownian particles. Okay. So what Einstein was doing, he was looking at collections of large number of particles. And from that, he could uh, say things. But Langeva actually wrote a, sim a simple equation for individual particles. And you have some extra information about uh, this. OK, so, uh, uh, so this is uh, for. Uh, uh, so here, all this. Uh, so this is an important term, which is noise, and uh, I mean uh, that's one of the things uh, which I work on, trying to understand noise uh, in different systems. Okay, so uh, so out here, what I discuss is thermal noise, and uh, we find that you you have different kinds of noises, and one has to understand. So I'll just give some other examples. So uh, now, if you supposing you look at a uh, bac uh, uh, like a bacteria, okay. So a bacteria is also some micron size object, and if you just uh, it's it's usually in a fluid, and if you look under the microscope, uh, you will see that uh, of course it's affected by all these random forces and all, and uh, so this is a, uh, some recent paper in uh, Nature where their motion looks something like this, okay. So bacteria also, I mean, uh, it looks a bit different from the Brownian motion in the fact that it tries to go in some direction, but then it's because of the noise, it keeps changing its direction. Okay. So this is, uh, I mean, it almost looks like a random walk, but it's not exactly a random walk. Okay. So it's, uh, uh, it's slightly more complicated. And uh, this is a very active area of research. It's called, uh, this area is called acti active matter physics. And uh, like there are a lot of interest in my institute in this area. And so basically, it's trying to understand uh, the motion of uh, living objects or things which are not really thermal, because there's some internal driving uh, force. Okay. But then uh, noise is important. And uh, you want to understand like how do you describe the motion of such objects. OK, so, uh, so in, in this case, what you find is that uh, the equations you write are much more, uh, are slightly more different uh, than what I wrote. And uh, so, so this bacteria is something, it's, uh, its equation of motion is not Brownian motion, but it's called active Brownian particle. And it has some equation like this. Okay, so this is just thermal noise, which I described earlier. But then uh, the bacteria. Uh, likes to go in the same direction. So then you add some extra uh, uh, forces. And uh, you can still write a simple mathematical model okay, to describe its motion. So that's the important point that you can, uh, if you want to understand exactly, so the bacteria moves because it has some cilia and filaments and all. It's very complicated. Okay, But the idea is, can you write a simple mathematical model to describe its motion? And uh, one is able to find such um, uh, models. Okay. And uh, then there are a lot of interesting things the, which are called collective behavior. If you put a large number of bacteria, so these are uh, pictures of uh, large number of bacteria. Uh, these are cylindrical bacteria. And then if you uh, have a large number of them, each of them is following some equation of motion like this. But if you put a large number of them, then you find all this collective behavior. Okay, So you find patterns and so on. OK, so. Uh, Right, so I, uh, so I I work in the area of this uh, statistical physics, and the basic idea is that uh, to understand uh, macroscopic properties, these are what you observe from microscopic properties, which are which uh, which is uh, the properties of the uh, molecules, the atoms, and electrons. You don't observe them, but you you observe the properties. Uh, uh, finally, you look at uh, you have a large collection of them, and uh, you uh, basically uh, observe their uh, uh, emerging emergent properties. Okay, so this is called collective uh, behavior, and uh, so what uh, the what you observe is of course thermodynamics, fluid dynamics. You I mean you know like heat conduction is Fourier's law, 
there's electrical conduction, Ohm's law. You there, you don't care about the molecules and all, right? But how does Ohm's law? There's a the conductivity of uh, of material or a thermal conductivity of material. How can you relate it to the uh, forces between the molecules, right? That's uh, that's that's the big question in statistical physics. Uh, so st for starting from all these fundamental equations, how do you go to this? Okay, so that's uh, the basic idea, and. Uh, Okay, so if you look at inside a uh, uh, inside a fluid, it looks very complicated. Uh, there's large number of uh, like uh, this order of molecules, and you can't uh, you can't solve the equations of motion for all these uh, uh, particles, right? And even if you follow, it uh, doesn't have much information. But the uh, important point is that because there are large numbers, you can actually make very detailed uh, predictions. Okay, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so as you uh, pack, um, if you increase the density, you'll go from like so, uh, gas to uh, liquid uh, to solid, right? And uh, actually, so this is, these are called phase transitions, and then there's a very simple framework uh, by which you can understand uh, the properties of this large number of particles. Okay, so this is what, basically the idea of statistical mechanics. And uh, the whole thing rests on a very simple principle that uh, Boltzmann, uh, this uh, Gib, I mean, uh, 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 Ludwig uh, Boltzmann, he developed uh, in uh, around the 19th, uh, late 19th century. Uh, and what he said that, okay, you have this complicated uh, uh, box of gas, and it's very difficult to look at what's going on. Uh, okay, but what all you need is, if you know the total energy in the system, the number of particles and the volume, then you can compute. Uh, then uh, you can uh, compute a very uh, a function called an entropy. Okay, and uh, what this function does, it just tells you, I mean, in how many possible ways can you arrange all these part particles satisfying these constraints? Okay. So you have a given, uh, so energy is described by something called a Hamiltonian, uh, which is like kinetic energy plus potential energy. And with the same energy, you can uh, put particles in different positions, have different momentum and all. And you can ask how many configurations are there that, uh, that give you this, uh, that uh, have exactly the same number of particles, volume and energy, okay. So if you, you just, this is a counting problem, you just count the number of configurations. And uh, so let's say this the number of configurations is W. Then there's this very simple relation, S equal to K log o, uh, W. And uh, this has all information about equilibrium properties. Okay? So if you want to compute the specific heat of the substance, you can just use this function. If you want to compute its magnetic susceptibility, it's, uh, so all inf information is there. Okay? So this is quite an amazing discovery. And uh, <coughs> this formula is actually, so this is Boltzmann's grave, and this formula is written on his grave. Uh, one interesting story is actually this formula was first written by actually Planck, Planck, okay. But I mean Planck actually uh, gives credit to that uh, it was really understood by uh, Boltzmann and so it's, uh, it's quite uh, appropriate that he gets the credit for uh, this formula. Okay, so, uh, right, so this is uh, what uh, like uh, what we do in statistical physics. Just try to compute this function, and then, uh, but this produces equilibrium properties of a system. Okay, so the other interesting question is like, uh, what are known as non-equilibrium properties. Like, uh, so the simplest situation is like if you take a, a, a box of gas and there's a piston in between, and then you release the piston. Okay, so this is called free expansion. So during free expansion, the gas is expanding. Uh, and uh, is there some way we can understand the expansion of the gas? Okay, so. Uh, so then this function is not enough, you need more information, okay. So in this case, uh, so this is again, uh, like I just show a, a one-dimensional example, like uh, you have a box of particles, and uh, this is a small number of particles, uh, so this is a box uh, from here to here, and initially all the molecules are on this side, okay. And th this is a small number of molecules, this is a larger number, and this is a much larger number. And uh, if you see, uh, I mean, if you open the piston out here, then you see this gas expands. Uh, so in all these cases, uh, you'll see the gas expanding and filling the box, okay. Now you want to understand how does this uh, thing, uh, the, how does this thing happen? Uh, so of course, again, if you look at the, ask the, look at the individual molecules, it's too much information, it's uh, difficult to say anything. But what we can observe is like, we can observe like how many particles are there locally, we can look at the density and we can look at their uh, momentum. Uh, 
And uh, so these are the, what you can observe. Okay. So, uh, so these are called the density field, velocity field, and energy field. You can just count how many particles are there in a small region. Uh, which, and these regions are because there's large number of particles. I mean, the, here I just show 100 and 200 particles. But if there's like uh, billions of particles, then each small region that you can see already contains large number of particles. Okay. And then you find that uh, uh, even though this motion is very complicated, these things uh, satisfy very simple equations. Okay. So these are the equations of fluid dynamics. So if you, I mean, uh, I guess many of you have seen equations uh, called Navier-Stokes equation. If you are in engineering, you would definitely have seen. So this is, I'm just saying that uh, this simple system of atoms and molecules can actually be described by uh, the equations of fluid dynamics. And the big, I mean, uh, one question that is still not completely solved is how to go from this to this. Okay, so here you will see that there are some, there's a viscosity and there's a thermal conductivity that appear in this equation. And uh, you know, uh, so how do you get these numbers from the properties of the fluid? Okay, so that's, uh, those are some interesting questions. Okay, so this is the idea that I have been trying to, uh, uh, okay, so this is another example, uh, something called uh, anomalous heat conduction, which I work on. Uh, and so you all know about is heat conduction. Uh, it's like heat uh, is transported by three mechanisms, so like radiation, convection, and conduction. Now, it happens that in uh, systems in low dimensions, like nanotubes and, uh, let's say, uh, two-dimensional systems such as graphene. So if you look at heat conduction, and this is an experiment where you take a graphene sheet which is suspended, in, uh, uh, which is suspended between two uh, uh, islands, and you just dump in some heat, and you ask, how does it spread? Okay, so you find that uh, no, normally you expect that it should follow uh, Fourier's law, which means that the heat uh, carriers or the heat uh, phonons should just do diffusive motion. Okay, and uh, what uh, has been found recently is that uh, so if it is diffusion, then uh, just like the mosquito, they, the if the phonons should move something like this. Okay, but what is found is that in fact uh, they do something called a Levy walk, which looks like this. Okay, so Levy walk is it spreads much faster. So uh, at each time, it, uh, it can take some large step. And then in the next time, it might take a small step in a random direction. But it's, uh, it's another uh, stochastic model, which, uh, which is a generalization of this random walk. It's called a Levy walk. And it uh, looks completely different. Okay. So this is like, uh, I mean, this is a very complicated system. But finally, you can understand it in terms of like what uh, uh, like you can think of like some effective uh, heat carriers which are doing some uh, uh, motion like this. Okay, so this is uh, the kind of pro problems that uh, we try to uh, look at. Okay, so the main message uh, that I uh, have tried to convey is that. Uh, there could be information in what appears to be random, and uh, what usually is important is that uh, there's this law of large numbers. Uh, whenever you have large numbers, uh, this leads to, uh, you can use the fact to arrive at uh, very predictive uh, uh, laws. Okay. Uh, Okay, so uh, now, okay, so the main part of the talk is done, and uh, then there's a, there's a small part which is a, a kind of a car, car trick, uh, which uh, I, I maybe I'll wait for. If there are questions, I'll uh, maybe first take them, and then if there's time, I'll uh, show the trick. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, uh, basic idea is that there can be hidden patterns in completely random looking uh, sequences. It's kind of not completely related to what I uh, talked about, but there is some relation. And uh, so maybe I'll first stop for uh, questions, and then if there's time, uh, I'll show the trick. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, so I, if there is time, then I'll show the this uh, there's a card trick. You can, you can show it. I'll show it yeah. first. Is it okay? So maybe I'll first uh, show the trick. Okay, so basically uh, I'll need uh, uh, five uh, uh, volunteers. Uh, so this is uh, 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 I mean who know I mean about a little bit about cards like they should be able to identify. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
uh, the faces. So I need five volunteers to come to the stage. Uh, yeah, come. <laughs> I mean, this, I won't ask any questions. Okay, so it's uh, like. Uh, hi. Five people. Hi. Yeah, so five people. One, two, three, four, five. Good. Uh, Okay, so uh, so I have a pack of, okay, it's not 52 cards, it's 30, 31 cards, okay. It also works with 52, but then it's a bit harder. And uh, this trick basically uses a lot of maths and a bit of uh, telepathy. And uh, okay, so basically what I'll do is uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, like kind of shuffle this card many times. And then I'll ask the five of them to pick one card uh, each from the top. And then I'll uh, try to predict what the cards they pick. Okay, uh, okay. So basically, uh, uh, I'll cut the card. So basically, I'll just uh, go like that, and you have to stop. Tell me when to stop. Okay, and uh, you can tell me any time. So I just do that. Okay, so that's one. You can also do. If you want more, you can do. It's why. Okay. Okay, so I've done five times. Uh, I can do more if, uh, if you're uh, suspicious. Uh, and then I'll give uh, one card to each of them. Don't show it to me. Uh, so you can just, yeah, you can see it. Uh, I just give uh, one card to each person. Uh, okay, and, uh, okay, and then uh, this, uh, the telepathy path comes part of the, uh, okay, I need a pen actually. Does anyone have a pen? Okay, I have a pen. Okay, so there's also some bit of math and some bit of uh, telepathy. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, so you have to try to communicate the card to me, uh, but not verbally, of course. But just try to communicate using. Uh, you have to just have to think about the card. Okay, so uh, okay, so you are you are thinking, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, Okay. Um, okay, so I, I mean, it's a bit hard. Uh, okay, so I think you're not thinking hard enough. <laughs> so maybe actually, uh, maybe I need some more information. I'll just ask those who have red color to raise your hands. Uh, Two of you only, is it? Okay, so you have read and you have read. Uh, okay, so I think uh, uh, so your card is probably uh, two of uh, spades. Right, okay, so that's the first. And uh, maybe you have uh, four of diamonds. Okay. Um, and you have eight of uh, spades. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, you have eight of diamonds. Okay. And you have clubs, ace of clubs, ace of spade, right? Yeah. Ah, okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's the trick. Okay. So thanks. You can go.
Okay, so maybe I'll quickly try to, uh, so the, I mean, though uh, I, uh, so of course I don't know if you, uh, any of you believe in telepathy, of course there's nothing called telepathy. So uh, it's all it's just pure maths. And I'll just try to explain quickly uh, the maths. Uh, okay, so the, I, this third, I had these 31 cards which I uh, actually arranged in a particular way. Okay, so it's a sequence uh, which is arranged in this definite order. Uh, there's 31 cards out here. And uh, of course, I can't remember. It's difficult to remember this entire sequence, right? So, and uh, then the question is just by knowing, uh, so the, whatever, the information that I collected is the colors of the cards, right? Now, from these colors, how do I uh, uh, find, uh, uh, find the, how could I predict exactly what uh, card it was, okay? So basically, uh, the idea is that you can, uh, so there's red and black. And uh, you can construct this binary sequence out of these uh, cards. Okay. So every time there's a red, I put a one, and uh, uh, so so this red thing goes to a one here. Two blacks go to zero zero, and then this three uh, five uh, reds go to five uh, ones, and so on. Okay. And uh, then I arrange it on a circle. And uh, what you notice is that when I do that the circle remains unchanged, okay? So this is like periodic boundary conditions, okay? So if you cut that, the sequence of the cards doesn't change, okay? So that's why it's okay to, if you cut it, nothing really happens, okay? So that's kind of cheating, but that's, uh, I mean, how it works. Uh, okay, so, uh, so this sequence of uh, ones and zeros is pre always preserved, okay? And this sequence is very special in that uh, if you look at, uh, uh, Okay, so uh, if you take any five uh, consecutive numbers, so let's say one, zero, zero, one, one, okay. And then the next uh, zero, zero, one, 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 okay. And then you have zero, one, 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 okay. So if you look at five consecutive uh, digits, then you will never find a one, zero. So one, zero, zero, one, one, it occurs only in one place, in this entire place, this thing, okay. So each sequence of five digits, occurs only once, okay. So there are, of course, 32 possible sequences. Each guy can uh, occur in two ways. So there are 32 possibilities, and I have 32 uh, numbers. So therefore, I have arranged that every, uh, uh, every uh, uh, sequence is there exactly once, okay. Now, this five, uh, uh, these five digits actually con contain information about my card, okay. So what I do is, uh, uh, so uh, th there are four possible suits like di diamond, uh, uh, then hearts, uh, clubs, and spades. So I need at least uh, two digits, right, to store that information. So out of these five guys, the first two guys stored the information on the color, and then there are eight uh, numbers: one, two, uh, ace, one, two, th ace, two, three, four, five, two, eight. So there are eight numbers, and I need three binaries to store that information, right? So that for each of these five digits. It has complete information to tell me what uh, card. So when I see something like one zero zero one one, so one zero basically immediately means diamonds, and zero one one means uh, means what? What is the number zero one one in uh, when you convert from binary to three? Right? Yeah. So this is three, and this one zero zero I code for uh, spades. And uh, this is uh, a seven, right? So seven of eights, okay. So when I know their number, I immediately know uh, what is, the, uh, what is uh, each card, okay? And then I also have a rule of uh, like, given this thing, how does it uh, go to this, okay? So there's some uh, binary operation which generates this entire sequence, okay? So there's some uh, rule which I won't explain. But uh, so basically that's the idea. There's some, uh, so this is some very, uh, uh, so this card trick is based on something called De Bruin uh, sequences, uh, which is what I just told uh, you. Write a sequence such that uh, no uh, particular uh, sequence uh, is repeated. Okay, so this is called De Bruin uh, sequences, and it's very important in uh, like lots of areas, and a uh, lot of magicians actually use uh, this trick. Okay, so I'll just end by again uh, giving two uh, references. So, so this is a nice. These are popular uh, art, uh, books on uh, random walk, and uh, the the second book is uh, on uh, this card tricks and various other mathematical uh, uh, tricks. 
so this is uh, written by this person called Diakonis and uh, Graham. So Pers this Percy Diakonis is a very interesting character. He started his career as a, uh, as a magician. And now he's a professor of uh, mathematics in uh, Stanford, okay, so uh, in the statistics department. And uh, he's, uh, he actually invented this uh, card game. Okay, so thank you, and uh, I'll take any questions. Okay, yeah, you, you can, uh, any questions I, I can take, uh, like. The mic is coming. <coughs> yeah. Shraddha. How about the arrangement of uh, flies? Yeah. It was in the circular pattern. Yeah. So how exactly it was compared with your theoretical and practically? Ah, okay, so like uh, you're saying because it's in three dimension, the actual. Not this one, sir. Uh, this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, your question is, uh, how did I? Sir, when I just have a look at this one, so yeah. you can see a circular like pattern. Yeah. So you, this, okay. So uh, so these are the positions of the mosquitoes after some uh, time. Okay. okay so Two thousand mosquitoes are plotted. Okay, now I just count that this is a circle at radius r and this is a circle at r plus some distance. I mean, how many points are there between these two points? Okay, so then I just make a histogram. Like I make uh, count at different positions from uh, here, at different radial distances, and I make a histogram, then this is the histogram, and this is the, pl the other thing is the plot of this function. Okay, so then you see that they match exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Sir, you uh, started the question in two dimensions, but when you are uh, looking at the diffusion process, you are measuring it, you are writing Newton's equation in only one dimension. So aren't you losing information? Uh, Okay, so maybe uh, you're asking about this equation, is it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so this is, I mean, of course, I wrote the equation only in the uh, vertical direction. Yes. You can also add uh, dx dt equal to whatever. So, in the, of course, you can write an equation in the x and y direction. But all the three directions, uh, at least in this example, are uncoupled, right? No, but... Uh, so, you can write x yeah, and y also similarly. I mean, there will be noise this in the... These equations will get decoupled, but when you started with a random work in two dimensions, so how can you argue like... Uh, no, sorry. I mean, I demonstrated everything in 1D, but you can write everything in any dimensions. So the random work, like, uh, the, when I talk about the mosquito, I mean, like, uh, if you are doing, it's in two dimensions, right? Right now, I yeah. can do a random work in two dimensions. Yeah. So every, the theory you can write in any dimension. Oh. And uh, these equations also you can write in any dimensions. Okay. Right, yeah. So can I uh, see the slide which is after four? Uh, after the after four, um, four forward. Yeah, sir. Next one. Yeah, this. This one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. Um, is it only the macroscopic state really disturbs this? Uh, sorry, say, say again. The um, you have said that um, we have we have we are observing only the macroscopic yeah. states. Only the macroscopic states are dependent on this, or, or the microscopic states will microstates will have an impact on this. So, so what I mean is that I mean what you can observe is like uh, when you have a gas, mm. you can't really look at the molecules, right? What you can look at is what you can measure is let's say. Uh, I mean, what is the density in a given region, uh, like uh, at the various places? 
So those are like the what I call macroscopic observables. Yes, sir. So those are, uh, they don't have information on individual molecules. They just have like total, what is the total number of molecules in a given region? What mm. is the total energy or what is the temperature? Temperature is basically like energy, right? Yeah. You can measure the temperature. Temperature is like a very statistical thing. Mm. Uh, but uh, so those are the things you can measure. And then uh, the, the whatever you can measure, you can, uh, even though at a microscopic level there is a completely random motion, mm. but because there is these large numbers, eventually the measurable things are all deterministic. Mm. Okay, so these are like when you write equations for fluids, it's completely deterministic, right? There's no randomness uh, out here. And uh, these, are the, uh, uh, this is, these are the equations which you can, uh, like these are predictive equations and uh, these are the macroscopic uh, quantities. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, if we consider like two atoms or two small particles, uh, we can predict they are, how they are going to move in the future, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, uh, you can predict if you know, see, because yeah, the like force is acting between them and all other things. That you have only two atoms, no, yeah. no, no other atoms. Yeah. Yeah. Then you know exactly yeah. right. Yeah. But like this universe, and uh, if you consider like like at some point it is isolated from everything else, uh, other forces. Yeah. And if you have supercomputer uh, which can calculate all the forces, yeah. can't we predict the future? Uh, if you have two, you can I mean, with a supercomputer. If even if you have a thousand, maybe you can predict it uh, with if you have a supercomputer. Let's computer, say maybe. like for the imagination part. Let's say we have a computer which can calculate all the forces acting in it. Yeah. So can't we predict the future? With but that. not if you have 10 to the power 23. I mean, so no supercomputer can... Uh, no, I'm like asking you to imagine. It's not yeah, predicted in principle, yet. In principle, you can predict, but then you, you don't gain anything also. You, yeah, in principle, of course, it is... Uh, so I mean, okay, if you are doing Newton's uh, equations, but once you go to quantum physics, it yeah. becomes even more difficult because these are wave functions and then uh, there is more probability there already, right? Wave function is a, already a probabilistic uh, notion. Then it becomes more complicated, but in principle, yes, you can. If you know the state at time zero, you know the state at all times. Uh, so then, in a way, can't we like say, if we had that computer, we can predict like our future, what we are going to do next, every humans. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, in principle, yes, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, basically, our future is already predicted, like predefined. We know that. Like for, uh, only for the theory part, I'm not going for math. Yeah, right in now. principle, I mean, that's a very d d deep and difficult question. Yeah. I mean, uh, see, there's a theory in quantum mechanics which says that, this, it's called theory of many, uh, uh, many universes, okay. So because at each time, uh, quantum mechanics, it says that you can do many, uh, like many possibilities emerge. Okay, and uh, why is one selected? But uh, sir, it's not widely accepted. Like, yeah, most yeah. of so this is, yeah. a, I mean, it's, it's a very, uh, I mean, hard question, really. So. Like, I mean, is it really completely deterministic? I mean, that's a, a deep and philosophical question. Uh, yeah, I mean, in principle, if you just I believe in, uh, okay, quantum physics is the fundamental or Newtonian physics is the basics, then yes, of course. But uh, there are also, like, quantum mechanics we don't understand completely. Yeah, okay, there are some lot of uncertain parts. And uh, so, they, therefore, the answer is not completely clear. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. On behalf of all of you and also from our uh, Reva family, we thank, sir, Professor Dar for his uh, inspiring talk.